Welcome to our service today. We want to welcome members of RPC and any friends joining in with us. You're all most welcome. And we trust that you are knowing the blessing and the protection of God in these days. Another week in lockdown, and yet it's one week closer to being back together again uh, in our meeting house. Folks, we just simply must persevere, hard as it is. If you do feel lonely or isolated or spiritually, physically, emotionally weak, then we urge you to reach out to friends in the congregation or perhaps to your elder or a member of staff for prayer or for help. We're always here for you. We'd ask you to please view our weekly email for all the announcements for the congregation. If you don't receive that email, there's an application form on the website where you simply fill in your details and you will receive it on a Friday or a Saturday. Or you can contact the office and Gladys will pass on the details to the team. This week in the announcement sheet, there's details about Sunday school, marriage preparation classes, church membership classes. You can read it all there in the email. Please do contact us if you have any questions or needs. We'll try our best to help you. We're here to worship God, so let us worship God. For our call to worship, Psalm 66. For the director of music, a song, a psalm. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works on man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious Rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. We'll end our reading there. May God bless even the reading of the psalm uh, to our hearts. Let's worship him now in prayer. Almighty God and our heavenly Father, you invite us into your presence, and we are so undeserving, so undeserving. And yet you invite us into your family. You invite us into your church, your body. You invite us into salvation. You invite us into your eternal home. And today, you invite us to worship you, to shout with joy to you, to sing the glory of your name, and to make your praise glorious. And indeed, as the psalmist says, how awesome are your deeds, so great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Guilty and unrighteous we are, and yet we're made not guilty and we're made righteous because of Jesus. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works on man's behalf, the psalmist says. We can take no credit for this. We have nothing to boast about. It's all because of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Justifier, our Savior. Father, you show us your way in your word. And today as we think about loving God and loving our neighbor, we realize just how poorly we do this. With heart and soul and mind, we are to love the Lord our God. Uh, you ask us to be 100% uh, committed in loyal love to you. But on our worst days, our love is poor. And even on our best days, our love is still not great. We confess our limited obedience, our limited trust, our, our limited desire for holiness. 
we confess. We love the world. We love our idols. We love our sin. We confess that we are selective in our love for you, and we're selective in our love for our neighbor. Forgive us, we pray. Fill us with your redeeming power and increase our faith and increase our desire to love you and to obey you, to be your disciples. Build up our obedience to you, we ask. Show us who our Messiah, who our Christ is. And may we see Jesus in all his glory. May we have Jesus change us and renew us. May we hear Jesus and heed him in all things. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that lies ahead and we await with expectation and excitement knowing that you have the best for us in the future. But in the meantime, please enable us, empower us to trust you and to love you the way we ought. We bring our prayers to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Well, hitherto Thy love has blessed me, Thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Cause Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Do to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee And prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above.
is worthy. Holy, holy is the Word made flesh. King who bore our pain and poverty. Come to claim the rebel and the wretch. Worthy, He is worthy. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34. This morning, we're we're going to see how Jesus summarizes the law, teaching us to love God and love others. Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34, this is God's word. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? 
For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Amen. We thank God for his word to us this morning. As we continue to worship God, let us come to him in prayer as we pray for others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even as we we gather here this morning, you have called us to be part of your global church. And so, Lord, we want to pray for our churches, both local and further afield this morning. We pray, Lord, as we worship, you would help us commune with you to be engaged and renewed by your word. Father, we ask that you would free our minds from distraction so that we may know your grace afresh this morning and to be challenged to live our lives in ways that honor and glorify you. Lord, we bring before you our PCI mission partners as they continue to serve you across the globe. We pray for Naomi Keefe, serving as a mission worker in, in Brazil. And we pray she would be strengthened and encouraged as she remains faithful to your word. Lord, we pray for the children of the Good News Club as they undertake devotional activities at home. Father, we pray for wisdom for Naomi and her colleagues regarding when to recommence physical meetings with the families in the flavelas. Lord, we pray more more broadly for the grave COVID-19 situation in Brazil, for the church as it seeks to provide care and support, and for the national healthcare system for its wise distribution of vaccines. Father, we also pray for Gary and Mary Reed serving in Kenya. We pray for them as they continue their work remotely and record video messages for their local church each week. Lord, we pray that as your gospel continues to be preached, that by your Spirit you would convict hearts and open blind eyes, so that many more in Kenya would would come to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Closer to home, Lord, we pray for Philip Welton in Arklow, Father, as lockdowns present obstacles to ministry, we pray he will find creative and effective ways to maintain contact with families who would normally attend weekly meetings. Lord, we also pray, if it's in accordance with your will, that Arklo would be able to run a holiday Bible club this summer in some format. Finally, Lord, we pray for our own local congregations at this time. We pray for ministers and elders across our land as they make every effort to feed, nourish, and comfort your people. Lord, we pray for things like virtual visits and phone calls, small acts of service that keep our eyes and our hearts fixed on you. Thank you, Lord, that you are the rock of our salvation, the unchanging God who loves and protects his people. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we bring our prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, boys and girls, we are thinking about how Jesus summarizes the Bible, teaching us to love God and love others. Jesus summarizes the Bible, teaching us to love God and love others. And to help us think about this, we're going to think about a set of rules. Now, I know that most of you are at home, but imagine you're back in school. Imagine you're back in your classroom. And maybe somewhere in your school or in your classroom, you have a list of school rules. Boys and girls, I'm going to give you 20 seconds for you to turn to your mums and dads and see if you can remember any of the rules you have in your school or in your classroom. Okay, so turn now to your mom and dads and see if you can remember any of the school rules that you have. 
Three, two, one, go. Boys and girls, when I was in school, just like you, I had a list of rules. Things like listen to your teacher, don't run in the corridor, line up in a straight line, and lots more. And sometimes, boys and girls, school gives us so many rules that it can be hard to remember them. And sometimes, if we're honest, we do break the rules. But boys and girls, even if you maybe forget some of the rules, did you know that you can summarize them? And that means you can bring them all together in a really easy way. All of the rules are brought together when we listen to our teachers and be kind to others. In school, these are the two most important rules, that you listen to your teachers and that you be kind to others. And did you know the same is true for us in the Bible? As we read the Bible, God gives us rules to help us follow him. And sometimes, just like in school, we don't always obey God's rules. But there is good news in today's story because Jesus helps us. Jesus has kept all of God's rules perfectly. He never sinned. He never did or said anything wrong. But he perfectly obeyed God. Boys and girls, Jesus knows we are not perfect He knows that we don't always obey God's rules. And so Jesus helps us. Jesus summarizes the Bible. He brings all of the Bible together and he teaches us to love God and love others. He teaches us to love God with everything we have and to love others, our friends, our family, and even maybe the people we don't always get on with as well. Jesus wants us to love God and love others. Boys and girls, these are the two most important rules in the Bible. And Jesus calls us to love God with everything we have and to love others. Let's pray to God, asking for his help as we try to understand this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you that he perfectly obeyed your rules, that he never sinned or did anything wrong. Father, we thank you for this story this morning. And we ask that you would help us to remember the two most important rules, that we are to love you with everything we have and to love others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles again at Matthew 22. What we have here in Matthew 22 are a series of confrontations between Jesus and the different religious leaders. Jesus had already warned them of the danger that they were in with those three parables. Do you remember the parable of the two sons, the parable of the tenants, the parable of the wedding banquet? The religious leaders knew what Jesus was doing. They knew he was targeting them. And so they're fighting back. Now remember, this is the last week of the earthly ministry of Jesus. It's packed full of symbolic acts and deep teaching all coming from Jesus. The religious leaders feared and hated Jesus. They wanted him dead. But of course they knew that Jesus was extremely popular with the crowds. And so they had to be very careful The message that was coming from the lips of Jesus and the actions of Jesus were clear, unmistakable, like bright light in the darkness. But they did not want that light. They did not want his truth. And what we study today was actually the last recorded conversation Jesus had with these religious leaders. They probably weren't aware of this, but Jesus would have known this, and that's why he particularly asks the the question that we have in verses 41 and 42. So despite their 
evil intentions, despite the fact that they wanted him dead, Jesus graciously warns them and calls them. And he's asking them to turn to him, their, his, their Savior and their Lord. The questions asked of Jesus were designed to damage him, to trip him, to trap him, to trick him into making a mistake or two and losing popularity with people or with the Romans or whoever. For instance, the, the question in verses 15 to 17 about paying taxes and responsibility to government. This could have been a disastrous banana skin slip by Jesus. And then there was the question in 24 to 28, this mocking question about the resurrection that came from the Sadducees. Again, it could have been a disaster, but not, of course, to the one who is true wisdom. Then we have the third question in verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is what does God expect of us, basically? If you had to summarize it, that's a very good question, as we will see. And then the fourth question actually comes from the lips of Jesus himself to the religious leaders, and it's the most important question of all. We see it in verse 42. Who is the Christ? Who do you think the Christ is? Whose son is he? Who is the Messiah? So today we're going to look at that third question, And the fourth question, and we're going to see that one was a good question, but the second one, which sounds maybe just a wee bit awkward, actually is the better question. First of all, then, the good question we have in verses 34 to 40. You see, the Sadducees had brought a ridiculous question to mock the idea of the resurrection. And Jesus silenced these uh, Sadducees with the teaching from the Word of God, the Word of God that they accepted, the Pentateuch. And they also argued from the power of God. And the Pharisees were actually quite happy because the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a mutual hatred. So the Pharisees came with another question, another attempt to trap and to trip Jesus. However, I, I think we're supposed to have a hope in our minds we're to hope against hope that the Pharisees would follow the example of the crowd in verse 33. You'll notice there, when the crowds heard this, that's the teaching about the resurrection, they were astonished at his teaching. See, Jesus actually agreed with the view of the resurrection that the Pharisees held. And so they, um, they come together in verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And you, you're, you're beginning to hope, maybe, 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 the Pharisees were changing their minds about Jesus, reconsidering their judgment of Jesus. But afraid not. They got together and they got conspiring against Jesus. And they picked one from the group and he came testing Jesus. Verse 35, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. That word tested uh, is exactly the same word used of Satan in Matthew chapter 4 in the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. It was also used of the Pharisees in chapter 16 verse 1 and chapter 19 verse 3. The aim was very clearly to undermine Jesus, to hurt him, to damage him, to destroy him. We've got to remember, the hearts of these men were evil. The hearts of these men were hard. There was clear evidence about who Jesus is, clear evidence about what he came to do, but they would not accept his teaching. They would not accept the evidence. The sad reality is, many, many people do not want the truth. Even Jesus found this to be so. And if he found it to be so, so will we. But we are to declare it anyway. Why? Because it encourages us that even the rehearsal of the the gospel as we shared with people is good for us. It builds us up in our faith and understanding. And it also encourages our brothers and sisters who listen on. But we also keep on witnessing. We keep on declaring the truth just as Jesus did Because we know that truth, when declared, is sown deep into the hearts of those who hear it. 
We're told uh, later on in, in the story of the church in the book of Acts that some of the religious leaders were converted. In chapter 6, verse 7, if you want to look it up. Perhaps it was some of these men who set out to trap Jesus and to trick Jesus on that Tuesday of the first Holy Week. Perhaps it was. Some of these guys, maybe it was the very person who was asking the question, who later on came to put his trust in Jesus. You see, truth sown in witness is never, never wasted. We've got to remember, of course, it's God who saves in his time and in his way. Rico Tice taught us uh, that we preach Christ, but it's God who opens up blind eyes. And so we keep on witnessing and praying that in our declaration of the gospel, that the seed will be sown in hearts and that it'll bring an immediate harvest or perhaps a harvest sometime in the future. But always remembering it is God who does the work of salvation. And so we have this question. It's not a stupid question. Uh, It's a very important question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Whatever the motive was behind the question, Jesus takes the question head on. Basically is, how are we supposed to live? What is our obligation to God and to man? What is our duty as followers of God? The response is very clearly, love. We are to love. We are to love God and we are to love our neighbor. Love God, verse 36 and 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And we're to love our neighbor, verse 39. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting the law here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Leviticus 19, verse 18. Two commands to love. This is the prime duty of life. This is what God expects of you and me, of us, his people, to love him and to love our neighbor. J.C. Ryle says, love is the grand secret of true obedience to God, knowing God, loving God, delighting in God. What does this actually look like? Well, there's a couple of things I think we can take uh, from what Jesus says. It's totally committed love, verses 37 uh, through to 39, which you've just read. We're talking about 100% committed love. That's what he's getting at in verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. See, Israel's love, remember this was first said to the people of Israel, Israel's love is to be directed wholly and exclusively to Yahweh their God. It was not to be shared with false gods. And of course for us this is very, very important because we are surrounded by idols and false gods. Paul tells Timothy that in the last days there will be terrible times where people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. There's a thousand different ways to create our own individual idol portfolio. And yours will be different to mine. There's this constant battle to remove these idols from, the, from our hearts and destroy them, to smash them, and to keep them smashed. And then, then at the same time, loving or the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our minds. And we know, don't we, that today, now, even as we sit and listen to this message, we can be saying, God, take away these idols. I I, I confess my sin. I repent of them. I smash these idols. We know that within hours, days, these idols are back where they should not be on the throne of our hearts. So what God is getting at here is that we're to love him with committed love, exclusive love, 100% committed love for him, nothing else, and no one else should get into that place. Heart, soul, 
mind. This does not um, describe separate compartments of the self. Rather, it's the Hebrew way of, of saying that a person must love God with his whole being, with every part of his character, with nothing held back. So it's not measured love. It's not that kind of, oh, I love you 75% of the time with 75% of my love. No, it's everything that we are. It's everything that we have is to be given to him. It's our entire life. We are to be zealous in our love. Dare I say it, we are to be fanatical in our love. In fact, there's no restriction on how much we should love God. All our heart, all our soul, all our mind. And when this is lived out properly, can I assure you that it is attractive and it's beautiful to God and to people around us? If it's not attractive, if it's not beautiful, then it's not love. Yes, perhaps it will make some people around us just a little bit uncomfortable when we love God that way. They may feel a little intimidated when we love God that way, especially if the some who feel uncomfortable and who are intimidated do not love God very much. That's what we would expect. But we're to love with total committed love, nothing held back, heart, soul, and mind. But it's also to be unselfish love, loving others, verse 39. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19 commands the Israelites to love others around them as, in fact, they love themselves. Again, 39, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, as yourself is only there to make a point of comparison with normal self-love. God is not saying that self-love is desirable or compulsory, but we do remember what Paul said to the Ephesians, no one ever hated his own body. But we love ourselves, don't we? We're to love others. We're to love our neighbors. We're to love people as we love ourselves. Totally committed love, unselfish love for God and for our neighbor. But there's also another thing that I think is worth saying in verse 40. Because verse 40 tells us that our love must be totally obedient love. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, the idea of love is greatly misunderstood these days. The world and even many in the church have such an inadequate view of love. One of the uh, writers that I was reading this week talked about our love being uh, soppy and sloppy. I like that, soppy and sloppy. But we can't use love to justify our sin and our selfish actions. Often we do. We say, oh, it's love. That's what's making me do this. As if that's going to justify it. Love is not a way to get around obeying the will of God. In fact, it's the opposite. Love is the foundation for doing the will of God. Love God, love your neighbor, and then do verse 40. Basically, follow and observe all that the law and the prophets teach. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments to love God and to love our neighbor. Now, let's make sure we understand what Jesus is getting at here. People do use love to justify sin rather than using love to justify holiness or obedience. I'll give you an example. A man will leave his wife and his children because, what? He loves another woman. That's what he says. I'm in love with another woman. 
How could that be wrong? Actually, he loves sin. He loves self. And he uses love to justify his behavior and his new lifestyle. And it's not right. It is wrong. It is sin. All the commands of Scripture hang on loving God, doing as he says, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So we're not free to disobey God. We're we're not free to uh, displease him. God sets the limits on who to love and what to love and when to love and how to love. He's got it all in place. It's all there given to us in the scriptures and, of course, in the person of Jesus. God defines love and we are not free to go outside his limits. He desires and he deserves total obedient love. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, verse 40. So let's be clear again about what this means. Because I think it's very important. We could just go over this and say, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do that. Okay, what's next? If you love God, then you will do as he says. Yes, it really is as simple as that. If you love God, you will do as he says. If you love God, then you are obedient in that love. Take the Ten Commandments as an example. You will have no other gods. That's number one. You will not bow down to any other idols. That's number two. You will not misuse his name. That's number three. And you will not misuse his day. Number four, total obedient love. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you will honor your parents. Number five, you will not murder. Number six, you will not commit adultery. Seven, you will not steal. Eight, you will not lie. Nine, you will not covet. Ten, you see, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. And that's just the Ten Commandments. We also have the rest of the Word of God to add to that. We have enough to be working on, studying, understanding, and obeying. If you obediently love God and your neighbor, if you understand what this truly means, and if you obey these two commands, it will keep you from causing much pain and hurt. It will keep you from causing damage to your soul, your family, your church community, and your world will be a better place when you understand that you're to love God and to love your neighbor. Totally committed love, totally obedient love, willingly doing these, actively and willingly obeying God and keeping these two commands. It's not, oh, I have to do what I don't really want to do. I'm resentful. I, I have to read. I have to pray. I have to give. I have to attend. I, I, I don't really want to, but I have to. And it's not, I don't get doing what I really want to do. I, I'm restricted from chasing my dreams and my desires because of God. I resent it. It's not supposed to be like that. See, when we're born of God, when we're filled with his Holy Spirit, we will want to be totally committed in our love and totally obedient in our love. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will reject sin and the flesh and the devil. See, this is really a good question. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? It's all about our duty and our obligation to love God and to love our neighbor. All the law, all the prophets, and what they say and what they teach hang on these two commands. So that's a good question, but actually there's a better one. And this one comes from the lips of Jesus himself. Basically, he's saying, who am I? You know, remember this is the last conversation? Who is the Messiah? Who is the Christ? That's really what this question is getting at. Jesus asks this question of his hearers. 
There's really actually two questions. What do you think about the Christ? And whose son is he? The Pharisees, you see, didn't believe in Jesus and didn't believe in his claims to be the Messiah, but they did believe what the Old Testament taught about the Messiah or about the Christ, or at least they thought they did understand what the Old Testament taught about the Messiah and about the Christ. And so the answer in verse 41, the son of David, this is the stock answer. This is what they really thought, that the Messiah would come from the line of David. And Jesus is really saying here in his answer, which we'll look at in a few moments' time, he is that, yes, he is the son of David, but the Messiah, the Christ, is much, 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 much more than just being the son of David. He's more than you could imagine him to be. He is more than, than you want to imagine him to be. He is of God as well as of David. He's saying, I am the Messiah and the Christ. Yes, I am the son of David. I'm in the line of David. But I am much, much more than just simply being a man born in the line of David. You see, the Pharisees got a little bit of the picture that, that the Messiah, the Christ, would be the son of David. But to help them get the big picture, Jesus teaches them in verses 43 to 45. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord. For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Wow. It sounds a bit complicated on first reading, even after the fifth reading. It sounds a bit complicated, but this is what Jesus is doing. He's quoting Psalm 110. And in that Psalm, David called his descendant the Messiah, not my son, as he could have, but he calls him my Lord. Do you get that? He could have called him my son, but he calls him my Lord. How could this coming Messiah, this coming Christ, be David's son and David's Lord at the same time? The answer is that the Messiah, the Christ, is David's son in the flesh, born of his line, but he's also God's son, and therefore his Lord, the Christ, the Savior, God. So in his humanity, he's David's son. In his deity, he's God's son. This is what he's getting at. David's son in the flesh, but also God's son. And Jesus is really saying here, it is the only way to make sense of the scriptures. It's the only way to make sense of Psalm 110. I am the only way to make sense of this text of scripture. Now, this is the last conversation, the last opportunity. And Jesus was giving them the evidence about who he was the ultimate proof from Scripture. Do you know who I am, Pharisees? Of course, Jesus asks us the question because the, the light is not on, on the Pharisees now. The, the, the spotlight's on me and you. He asks us, who am I? And you might be a little bit right. But do you have the right answer, the big picture? You see, he's, he's more than a historical person, more than a good man, a religious leader, a teacher, a prophet. Jesus says, I am the Christ. I am the Savior, the only one. So why? Why didn't the Pharisees not see this? Because they didn't understand their real need. The real need was their sinful hearts, proud, arrogant, self-centered, they never quite understood just how corrupt their hearts were. They saw all kinds of other needs, especially political freedom, independence from Rome, controlling people and society, power and influence. They saw all those kinds of things. That's all they were really interested in. They couldn't see the sin in their hearts. And therefore, they couldn't see that the Messiah truly would be God coming to save his people from their sins. They didn't see their sin, and so they didn't see their need of a saving Christ. Do you know 
what your real need is today. See, the Christ doesn't come to make you healthy or wealthy or happy or safer or moral or decent. The Christ came to save you from your sins. So do you know who he is? Do you know why you need him? Do you know why he died and rose again? Do you have him and his salvation? Do you have just a little bit of the story or do you have the big picture? The Christ came to save and they didn't see it. Verse 46, the response, no one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Silence. The last, biggest, best piece of evidence. Silence. Nothing to say. They heard the truth, but rejected it again. They saw the truth right in front of their very eyes and they despised him again. They were about to kill Jesus and yet in love and in grace, he told them the truth again. He told them the truth for the last time and they had it within their grasp. They had it in their ears. They had it in their minds, but they were not saved. In their pride and in their rebellion, silence. Blank faces, a shrug of the shoulders. And it's the last time Jesus spoke to them. And Jesus says to us, to you and to me today, Who am I? Who am I? That's the key question. Because I am a sinner, I need a Savior. And the Christ. Jesus Christ is that Savior. Because you are sinners. You need a Savior. Jesus Christ is that Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Trust in him. Receive his salvation. And over the weeks that lie ahead, we're going to see how that was all paid for on the cross of Calvary. And in the resurrection, we have the key to the gospel which means people like you and me can be saved from our sins. A good question, how we ought to live. A better question, who is the Christ? He is God, the Savior, Jesus himself. May God bless you as you seek to understand these things and explain them to your family and to your friends. Witness it to your neighbors. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the richness of this text of Scripture, your holy word, wonderful, powerful. And we pray that you will help us understand, yes, what it means to love God with all, all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and our neighbor as ourselves. But may we also understand who you are, that you are God, that you are Savior, and that you are King. Bless us and lead us, we pray. And may we know your leading in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My Jesus, I
See.